We're an island nation, drawn to the sea that surrounds us. A playground for some. For others, it's where they make their living. But the sea's unpredictable. It's Mother Nature, it's a beast. There to save our lives is a volunteer army of over 5,000 ordinary people. Cheers, mate. Ready to leave their jobs, their families, and race to our rescue. When the Pedro goes, it's that adrenaline rush every single time. You could make the difference between life and death. I feel very lucky. Then bringing me back to life again was a miracle. OK. Equipped with their own cameras. Just the two of you. Come on, yes. The crews give us a unique insight into every call-out. Nice deep breaths, OK? All right. As only they see it. The ambulance is here, OK? For those who risk their lives, yeah. it has become a way of life. Come on! Bringing loved ones home. OK. There's really no better feeling in the world. southeast corner of England, on the Kent coast, lies the port town of Dover. Dover is very much a gateway to the European continent. It's a, it's a gateway to even more history, more culture and more diversity. And I think it's all the more richer for it. With just 21 miles of open sea separating Dover from France, it's the closest English port to the European mainland and the lifeboat station here is one of the UK's busiest. The conditions of Dover, you know, can change just as quickly as anywhere else around the UK. We can have storms coming down from the North Sea or coming up from Cornwall and get false 10s, false 12s out there sometimes. It's, um, it can be a very, very dangerous place to be. It's a very dangerous crossing. Nevertheless, of the 9,000 lifeboat launches around the UK and Ireland last year, 290 were to migrant men, women and children making this perilous journey. People trying to cross the channel in a small boat to England, it can be quite dangerous for them. Um, obviously, it's a very busy shipping lane. Crossing the English Channel in an inflatable boat, uh, if you see the state of some of them, I wouldn't put it into my bass. Um, yeah, they're, they're a death trap. The scope of rescues have changed. Uh, and the frequency, but they are still all rescues, which is exactly what we're there for. Mid-September, shortly after 7am, a cool breeze blowing offshore. I was actually in the kitchen making myself a cup of coffee. Next thing, bang, Pedro goes. <laughs> that, was, that was the end of my coffee. A call has come in from the Coast Guard that a small inflatable boat has capsized six miles out in the channel. Whenever there's a call for people in the water, we know time is against us because of the temperature of the water. Um, and on that particular day, uh, the swells were quite big. As the crew launched their all-weather seven-class lifeboat, further information comes in over the radio. The capsized vessel had 30 people on board. First people in the water, that's obviously, you know, a mass casualty incident and that's when we realise it's a serious shout. We're going to have people who are going to be in serious health condition, potential fatalities. We were all quite worried about the amount of people in the water and by the time we got there, are we even going to be able to do anything? Are they going to still be breathing? Um, yeah, it's quite a surreal uh, thing to have to think about. With a Coast Guard helicopter also now en route, a further radio update comes through. Although most of the casualties have been recovered by another boat, five are still waiting to be rescued from a life raft. One might not be breathing. Okay. One might not be breathing. That's the last thing you want to hear. Um, so at that point, we were, we were getting ready to essentially start you know, CPR or start resuscitation. 25 minutes after launching, the crew arrive on scene. They're faced with a single life raft with the five casualties on board. The 
was another vessel that had picked up the majority of the other people in the water. We had this one life raft that was tied beside their vessel with the unconscious casualty in. One of the guys had broken English, but we were able to determine that it was um, part of a family um, who had come across together. Stay with your sister. They were panicking. They wanted to be on, on our vessel, on, on, a, on a safe boat, really somewhere somewhere warm. You come first, that he come first. This way, this way, this way, this way. As we started pulling them out, we we're very cold because not only were they wet, but they had several layers of clothes on. And once that all gets wet, they can't get warm, so they get colder and colder, slower and slower, and everything just becomes very lethargic. Ah. Okay, you're gonna have wait, to stand up, wait, okay? Wait, wait. Yeah. Breathing. <laughs> breathing, breathing. It's never easy getting people up out of the water or even in a life raft. Um, there's a bit of manual handling involved. She's not looking too great. She's going to be weak. OK. It soon becomes clear that the family group includes a teenage girl. We could both scoop her arm and pull her up backwards. You could tell they'd been through an ordeal. They had been in the water for quite a period. Their legs just weren't working anymore. They, they'd had enough, yeah. Underhand. Yes, yes, yes. Wait, 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 wait. And go. Yeah, OK, stand up. Come on, this way. One lady was very, very ill. The other four were ill, but one of them less so. You're all safe now, OK? You're on a nice warm boat. Blankets. Blankets. It's unclear how long the casualties had been in the water, but it's now almost an hour since the alarm was first raised. Hello, can you hear me, sir? All the casualties seemed really cold. Once we got them on deck, we were obviously handing out blankets, wrapping them up, and, you know, they were, they were hiding their faces in the blankets, wrapping their heads in blankets, so, yeah, you could tell they were cold. I need you to roll over, mate. You're on the lifeboat, OK? Out in the channel, the elements would have been stripping their body heat away from them into, they've shut, you know, they're shutting down into hypothermia. You feel sick? They weren't in good shape. Okay, um, yeah, I was a little bit worried. They weren't far off giving up, I don't think. Stay awake, buddy, stay awake. Although a helicopter is on its way with a paramedic on board, the seven class makes best speed back towards Dover. Hello, come on. Hello, can you hear me? We don't want to let people just go to sleep because if they are hyperthermic, you know, it's just a bad pathway to travel down. Hello, can you hear me, sir? Buddy, can you hear me? Because they're on the lifeboat and out of the water doesn't mean they're uh, home and dry. Can you hear me, lovey? Can, can you hear me? My name's Dan. The crew must now focus their minds on which of the five casualties they need to prioritise. All are now in varying degrees of consciousness. Can you hear me? It's almost like organised chaos. You know what you need to do, but there's just so much that needs to be done. You know, you're obviously going to try and keep communicating with them, keep them alert and active. Oh, oh, stay awake. Sir, stay awake for me. Keeps their mind ticking over rather than them just slumping over and trying to go to sleep. Hello? Hello? Hello, come on. Hello? It's hyperventilating. Within minutes, the teenage girl takes a sudden turn for the worse. OK, we've got non-responsive. Can you hear me? We caught her just before she fell and then we, we laid her down. Can we do a check for breathing? If I count. Okay, I want you to check for breathing. Wait there. You ready, Dan? Now. Nothing. I've got nothing at all. Couldn't get any detection um, of chest movements, of breath. We got nothing. And it's very hard to hear all those kind of things the body makes when you're in between two big engines. Let's open up the chest a little bit, OK? Wait there, and I want you to check, open up the airway. So we look for the visible rise and fall of a chest, which is the only thing we can do, um, and we couldn't really see it. That's five seconds. I'm not seeing a chest rising. The Coast Guard helicopter is now overhead but lowering the paramedic takes precious time, and with the casualty going downhill, the lifeboat crew can't afford to wait. We were thinking um, we're going to need to start to do CPR. OK, here we go. Wait there. You have a pause, um, and a million things are running through your head at once. 
you know, a bit of panic, a bit of worry comes in. I was ready with chest compressions. So I had my hands in the position. I was ready to go. Wait, 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 wait. One more check for breathing. I've got moving, I've got moving, I've got moving. Yeah. Okay. One more check. At the last moment, we saw the faintest of chest rises and it was it was incredibly faint. I'll say that's six over ten seconds. I don't six breaths over With the girl ten. now conscious, the crew administer oxygen to stabilize her condition. Okay. 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 You're treating someone here, you might be just getting a positive outcome from this casualty, and then someone on the other side of the boat then drops down. Okay, this guy's unresponsive as well now. He's going. Just a few metres away, the condition of the girl's father is also deteriorating. His breathing got worse, he was like coming in and out of consciousness, and it was just hard to keep him alert and keep him awake. Keep awake, keep awake. Stay awake, tell him to stay awake. Now watch here. With two casualties now in a critical condition and the three others under observation, medical backup arrives from above. All of a sudden, there's a little nudge in the back uh, and it's the winchman come down. She's gone unresponsive. We almost didn't detect breathing. It was so faint, but she's come back round. When you've got those multiple casualties going downhill, you're just trying to do your best to keep them stable, and that's where when you have the Coast Guard paramedic, it does almost provide that comfort blanket of you've got someone else that can help you out. Three, four, he's in green. We're OK. OK, can we feel? After receiving treatment, the father has now regained consciousness. We're going to warm you up. And there are encouraging signs from his daughter. The biggest sign of improvement, first of all, was the head started to move. So she was starting to get in a little bit fidgety, and then the eyes opened up. Um, and then she started holding my hand. Got it, got it, got it. Taking her inside just allowed the paramedic more space and allowed her to get a bit warmer. We're almost home now. Yeah. We're almost there now, lovey. How's the one inside doing? One inside's OK. Uh, who is he to you? My father. Your father? Mother. Your mother? OK. I've got my family at home. I still live with my family. I've got my two brothers. My parents, obviously, when you see that, that family unit there and, you know, what they're going through, that definitely, like, pulls at your heart. Over an hour after launching, the crew make their approach to Dover Harbour, with all five casualties now conscious and showing signs of progress. We're here. Done good. Done good. As soon as we saw, like, those hubbles or we're going through the hubbles, it is just such a sense of relief. You know, you're almost at safety and there's there's other resources on land that can then help you out. How long were you in the, in the boat from France? Uh, five hours. You were in five hours in the boat. How long have you not sleeping in? Two days. Two days, no sleep. And food, you've been eating? Little bit. Little bit, OK. Water? Or... No, no, no. Where do you come? Country. I'm from Afghanistan. You're Afghanistan. I don't think they were in a fit position to uh say thanks to us, but um, I do believe they were very grateful to, to be out of the situation they had been in. Obviously, it affects you. I guess seeing families um, with their little kids just makes you wonder how bad life was that they had to do this. You're OK. I've got it. You just walk in front of me, OK? At the harbour, the casualties are transferred to other agencies to receive further medical attention. We're a rescue service, and it's, you know, when we don't know what we're going to be presented with before leaving the side of the pontoon, we signed up to save lives at sea. When that pager goes off, uh, politics are the last thing in my mind. It's just somebody in danger on the water. We're going out to get them. That's it. Simple as. Crews on standby at the 238 lifeboat stations across the UK and Ireland. The support network extends far beyond the staff and volunteers themselves. 
The family members are definitely the unsung heroes of your and ally. Without your family support in the lifeboat, it won't work. Uh, you need your wife, partner behind you uh, at all times. I definitely think it can be tough for other family members when you're going out and shouts. You're on call 24-7. You don't ever switch it off. Two o'clock in the morning on my wedding anniversary. <laughs> So it was a few hours I was down at the lifeboat station and I think I wandered back home about 6am. It's to the point where the pager goes off and I'm to run down the station dressed like this. If the pager goes off, it's tools down, drop everything, go at a height, it's not a problem, Ken, it's not a problem. east coast of England, where the River Humber divides Lincolnshire and Yorkshire, is the town of Cleethorpes. Cleethorpes is a traditional northern seaside resort. People come for the day, have a fantastic day at the beach. You go there not expecting a lot and you leave thinking it's brilliant. It's, it's a great place to live. You don't expect Cleethorpes to take your heart, but it does. Each year, thousands of holidaymakers flock to Cleethorpes' five-mile stretch of golden sandy beach, a beach whose dangers have been recognised for centuries. There's been a lifeboat in Cleethorpes and Grimsby since the 1800s, and it was launched from Brighton Street, where we're launched from today. Over the time, the lifeboats moved from Cleethorpes to Humberston to Grimsby, and it's been back in Cleethorpes at its current location since the early 80s. Today, the station's 28-strong crew respond to around 60 shouts a year. We're a very close-knit crew. I love everybody on the crew. We know we've got each other's backs. Some of the crew are now what well, I'd say more closer to them than they are my actual friends. My life's on the line and I trust everyone down there with it. Ben signed up to the crew five years ago and is hoping his three-month-old son will follow in his footsteps. Hello, all right, how are we? Congratulations, Thank you very much. Congratulations. Youngest member of Cleethorpes is definitely baby Ralphie. He's, he's mint. Ralph is mint. It's because he keep you away from it. Um, no, he's really good. Is he? Yeah, really good anyway. It's well, Such a smiler in the morning. The mornings are the worst time for me. Oh, I've got good to wear. But then he smiles his head off and like, yeah, start the day right. You sure he is yours? <laughs> he's cute. Yeah. <laughs> Becoming a dad, it knocks you for six. You don't, because you're putting someone else before yourself. I wouldn't put myself in unnecessary danger, especially not, 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 not being a dad of three. <laughs> One of the main challenges facing Ben and the Cleethorpes crew are the strong tides that race in and out here. People say the tide's never in at Cleethorpes. Sometimes feels like that. I suppose that's what catches a lot of people out. The tidal range at Cleethorpes, the difference in height between low tide and high tide is, is five to six metres, sometimes seven metres, so it's, it's a big tidal range. It comes up a long way and it makes the beach completely different between low and high tide. As, as a kid living around in Cleethorpes, we've always had it drummed in by our parents, be careful. Early evening. Late March. Tide on the rise, but still with a couple of hours before it reaches its peak. It was quite a warm day, that sort of warm spring sunshine, which, which warms you up, but then it soon goes away. As soon as you get wet or get in the wind or get in the shade, it gets cold. A 999 call comes in about a man cut off by the tide at nearby Buckbeck Beach. We knew, given the tidal conditions that night, we didn't have a great deal of time to get there, so it was really get, get on and, and get gone. With less than an hour of daylight left, 
and the tide still flooding in, the crew launched their D-class inshore lifeboat within 10 minutes. The atmosphere on the boat is, you know, we've got a job to do. We've all got to work together to make sure we have a happy ending. Buckbeck Beach, where the casualty is stranded, is a mile east of the station. Only accessible at either side of high tide, this thin strip of sand has become known as Pirate's Cove, thanks to a pirate-themed bench that's recently sprung up here. The marsh that lies between the bench and the path is deep and difficult and dangerous, and at high tide, it's covered by a metre of water as well. It's boggy, you know, you can get stuck in the mud. You could be on an island, and all of a sudden, you're surrounded by water. You've got to get there, you've got to, got to get them off. Six minutes after launching, the crew arrive at Pirate's Cove and start scanning the beach for the casualty. There was concern because of the state of the tide that it would be flooding quite quick and that could possibly panic the casualty into making a rash decision, which is the last thing we wanted them to do. Protect the other hand, help. You don't know if he's already in the water. Obviously, if he's in the water, he's going to get cold, he's going to get hypothermic. You know, is he a swimmer? As the crew disembark, now being filmed from the safety of the shore by a concerned bystander, they catch their first glimpse of the casualty. So as we got close to the end, close towards where Buckbeck comes out into the sea, we could just see his head poking up over the, the back of the bank. Hello! I remember waving him over and him sort of stood still. There was a little bit of a panic when he didn't move. It, you know, I waved him over and he wasn't coming towards me. Ben and fellow crew member Joe make their way towards the casualty, just 50 metres away. Because it's sort of on a bank, as I got a little bit higher, I realised why he wasn't walking towards us. Oh! Oh, I see. He was on an island. Stay there. Stay there. Oh, that's why. That's why you're not moving. It's like the typical image you see of a pirate being left alone on an island while his pirate ship goes out in the sea. This guy was on an island on his own. Unfortunately, you're going to get your shoes wet, buddy. Yeah, I'm not bothered about that. Like yeah. That. Are you all right? Yeah, I'm fine, yeah. yeah. It's one of those things that might not look like it's a dangerous place to be, but a few more steps and he could have been in some uh, a bad place. What's your name? Oliver. If he had tried to get back himself, there would have been all sorts of dangers and difficulties on the way. I don't think he'd have made it back across the marsh. Don't worry about it, mate. Have a second to the ball, you know. Oliver, listen, mate, this catches everyone out, know, including us. Thirty-five years walking with dog and all that. Tommy, he was a local gentleman, massively embarrassed, and you know, and this is what makes you feel for him, because you really shouldn't be embarrassed. You shouldn't be embarrassed. You, you, no one ever goes out there to get stuck. I thought I'd be able to get by that way, but then I realised it's that little path there, isn't it? Yeah. And then it was cut off, no way. I mean, Oliver, can you see how quick it's coming in, mate? Yeah, it's going to catch yeah. anyone out. With the casualty safely on board, the crew head back to the Coast Guard team now waiting on the shore. It must be a normal walk going to the pub and then the kebab shop and ending up getting rescued. Really soggy feet, but apart from that, I was fine, yeah. Despite having lived in Cleethorpes his whole life and being a regular visitor to Pirate's Cove, Oliver hadn't checked the tide when he set off earlier that evening. After 35 years, I've never known it like that. I was just... I was caught off on all sides, yeah. There's just, there's just that bit of hillock where the shack is and then there's the marshland, basically. So I was cut off completely, yeah. With the water rising around his own private island, Oliver called the Coast Guard. The surrealness of the situation went and thought, right, this is real. I got caught. There is mud there. I was only 400 yards or so much out, but it's a long way because it is just marshland, so I didn't even consider trying to swim, I thought, no. Couldn't even paddle in it. It had been up to my neck, to be honest with you, so couldn't even walk it. 25 minutes later, help arrived. Can't 
thank them enough how quick they were, really understanding and just huge respect for them. I always had respect for them anyway. I just think, you know, really you've got to respect the sea because you think it won't happen to you, but it can happen to anybody, so. You got it, Oliver? Yes, yes. Nice to meet you, buddy. An hour and a half after he set off for his stroll, Oliver was delivered safely back to dry land, just in time for the takeaway he'd promised himself. I was hungry, so I just, I just went, it's, it's the Cleethorpes Marketplace, there's a lot of kebab shops here. Was it good? Very good, yes. Uh, it's my favourite. I, I can't take hot food as much, but I do like it hot, yeah. Anyway, well, thanks for that. Oliver, take care, buddy. Have a nice day. It's not the first time this year that we've been out and picked people up from that area. It certainly won't be the last. May not even be the last this week. I just remember him just being so apologetic. He really didn't need to be. This isn't a chore. We're on that boat because we absolutely love the air and the light. So, um, no apologies. You know, we love it. On the west coast of Wales, where the Irish Sea meets the county of Ceredigion, lies the Victorian resort town of Aberystwyth. So Aberystwyth on a good day is the perfect holiday de destination. The sun, the beach, great tourist attractions. I've lived here all my life. I wouldn't choose to live anywhere else, really. I love it in Aberystwyth. But there's a reason why there's been a lifeboat station here since 1861, a testament to the exposed nature of this stretch of coast. Aberystwyth on its worst day is somewhere where you don't particularly want to be. You want to be inside your house and batten down the hatches because it could be quite stormy. You can get four seasons in one day in Aberystwyth. It's, uh, it's, it, it goes from one extreme to the other and it can do quite rapidly. Paul has been on the crew for almost 25 years. He lives with his family on the seafront, just a few hundred metres from the lifeboat station. Beans, they come out of the allotment. Thank you. It's a house that's now home to not one, but three pages. Mine's always on. <laughs> In the past few years, Paul's been joined on the crew by his daughter, Seren, 22, and 18-year-old son, Dylan. It's quite common, actually, if, if we're, the three of us are having dinner, we do just leave. The t we would just leave, wouldn't we, and run down the station, pretty much. Sometimes put a pair of trousers on and <laughs> Maybe. treat ourselves to that. Seren, my, uh, my eldest, has been on the crew since she was 17. She uh, originally volunteered down at the station part of the Duke of Edinburgh doing a DOV down there. Dylan has been on the crew again since he was 17 and he's sort of uh, going through his, uh, his, his probationary training now as well. Got a few things I've got to do before becoming a helm. You'd make a crack in helm. I, pa I paid him to say that. <laughs> <laughs> For Paul's partner Kim, the lifeboat has long been an honorary member of the family. I can remember when, uh, when Dylan was a baby really small baby, and Seren was a very energetic four-year-old. And we had just laid out a beautiful picnic, and the pager went off, so, of course, Paul has to run like down... a hero. And I'm just left there with these three small children, <laughs> and I'm thinking, how am I going to get home? Um, that's how it used to be. There was a few times like that. I there remember. were a few times like that. Without having Kim's support in doing what I do on the lifeboat crew, I couldn't be part of the lifeboat crew, it's as simple as that. And without, you know, sort of that knowledge that I'm, I'm in a position to sort of be able to drop everything and go, knowing that Kim is there to pick things up. So that they are definitely the unsung heroes. You're the heroes. When the page goes off, I just <laughs> turn over and put the duvet over my ears. Late September, mid-morning. A fresh northwesterly wind is whipping up the seas off the Welsh coast. I remember the wind was really, really blowing. I could really feel it pushing against me. And there were some big waves rolling into the harbour entrance. A call comes in from the Coast Guard. A rigid inflatable boat known as a rib has lost engine power in the harbour and is drifting perilously close to the rocks at the end of the harbour wall. Once we arrived at the station, it very quickly became aware what the tasking was, because the rib that had broken down was actually visible from the lifeboat station. 
As events unfold just outside the station, shore crew member Paul starts filming from the harbour. It's quite unusual to be able to see what's going on um, and to have everything laid out in front of you. I think my first thoughts when I saw the casualty was that they're very close to the wall and obviously I was concerned for the people on board because it's not the day you wanted to be taking a boat out of the harbour entrance. With the rib in serious danger, the station's Atlantic 85 is launched within minutes and the crew start making their way across the harbour. We were obviously concerned that their vessel was, uh, was in a possible position where it may capsize and you've got casualties in the water, which is not a good place to be. It was imperative that we got to them as soon as we could. Just watch these rollers coming in here. Yeah. But as soon as they reach the harbour entrance, the crew are faced with large rolling swells. The waves were being channeled into the harbour entrance, which was making them taller. And as well as that, the waves coming past the casualty vessel were bouncing back off the rocks. Even though the rib is just 100 metres away, the crew have to wait for the right moment to get close or risk being capsized themselves. The Atlantic got to the harbour entrance and then they stopped. Um, and I presume they were surveying the scene to sort of decide how they were going to approach and what they were going to do. Most shouts, you get quite a long time to think about things and plan things through in your head because you might have, you know, you might have 10, 15 minutes to run to a, to a, to a casualty. In this scenario, we didn't have that opportunity. It was very dynamic, the, um, the, the, the thought process that were going on. Spotting a break in the waves, Helm Alex steers the Atlantic towards the rib. Yeah, see you over here, yeah? Just switch side. When we arrived at the casualty vessel, it was quite clear that we were uh, dealing with two fairly young men. We didn't know how long they'd been out there for as well, so they were exposed to the elements. They were wet and cold. You've got to factor that in as well. For now, the anchor is the only thing keeping the rib in place and preventing the casualties from being thrown overboard. I could see that they had an anchor out because they were staying head to sea. However, every time a large wave came, it looked like they were they were slipping, their anchor was slipping. Get ready to dump your anchor, OK? Not only was the casualty vessel becoming closer to the rocks, for all the time we were alongside them, we were getting closer to the rocks and closer to the danger area as well. With the ribs anchor slipping and the rocks getting ever closer, the only way to get the casualties out of danger is for Paul to get a tow line across. Are you ready to send the line? When you throw a, a, a line, um, it's always a little bit of a challenge. Sometimes you can um, you can fluff it and you can it can go completely pear shaped. Right, tie on quick as you can. The casualties are now attached by both a tow line and an anchor line. With multiple lines in the water, the crew of both boats need to act fast. Hey, watch you got your over there anchor line now. There was quite large waves coming in, and there was also a risk of us getting the casualty vessel's anchor line stuck around our propeller. Worst case scenario, you foul both props, it could fully compromise your ability to sort of uh, to operate the vessel effectively, and we would have be become actually casualties ourselves. Right, dump your anchor line, guys! Once they'd effectively attached our tow line to their vessel, uh, only then did we instruct them then to cut their own line. OK, they're free. OK, to the line in the water. The anchor line's gone. With the casualties anchor line cut and the tow line secure, the Atlantic can now drag the rib to safety. There is definitely a moment of relief to think that your job's done. From the point that we threw the tow line to them cutting the line to us towing them away, it felt like it happened in seconds. It's all right, mate. Don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. Don't worry. The casualties looked very relieved as soon as we got them into safe water. Uh, we secured, the, secured them onto a pontoon and had a chat with them, and they were very grateful that we were able to help them. I think you did well, boys, actually. You, you've secured oh, the boat. It doesn't matter, you've, you've, you've secured the boat, and that's the main thing. You're both well. I believe that they may have had engine problems, and that was the reason why they were stuck where they were stuck. All right, see you. 
The casualties, two young men who'd borrowed the boat for the day, walk away unscathed. Okay, okay mate. Thanks so much. Good. Worst case scenario in my mind for that shout would have been the two people would have ended up in the water. They did have personal flotation devices on, which is great. However, more than likely they would have been smashed up against the rocks. I've got nothing to add to that, it was spot on. Thanks, boys. After this particular shout, I probably would have gone home and told um, my family members uh, if, if they weren't there already as part of the shore crew, filled them in on what happened and how it was achieved. I'm just really proud of them, actually. I do worry. I worry about them all the time. I think that's a mother's um, curse and blessing. And now with three of them running down there, you'd be a fool not to worry because the sea is treacherous, the sea is scary. Um, but they know the risk. They were, they've been brought up by the sea. They're sensible people. A hundred and forty miles away in Devon lies the popular tourist destination of Tor Bay. Its sandy beaches and sunny climate have earned it the nickname the English Riviera. Tor Bay is a collection of three main areas, Torquay to the north, Paynton in the middle, and Brixham to the south. It's a lovely part of the world. There's a bit of everything that you need. We've got a fish key here, Brixham Fish Key, which is one of the largest in England. So we have a lot of beam trawlers, day boats going out. We've got ferries, pleasure boats. We've got a lot of paddle boarders, kayakers. It's very busy waters around here. There's been a lifeboat station here in the historic port of Brixham since the Great Gale of 1866. There was a storm where a lot of the fishing industry was destroyed. The wind turned to the east and a large proportion of the fleet was smashed up and several lives lost. I think that's probably what spurred the start of the lifeboating in Brixham. These days, the crew here deal with over 100 shouts a year. At Brixham, as a crew, we all gel together, we all mix together and nobody's better than anybody else, so everybody sings off the same hymn sheet. I don't think you can ever be prepared for every eventuality. Sea conditions change very quickly, catches people out. Early May, and with a strong southerly breeze, conditions for a yacht race between Brixham and Dartmouth are looking lively. We knew there was a race, so there was a chance something might go off, but we weren't really preparing for anything. A yacht has sent out a mayday, meaning the lives of the six crew on board are in grave and imminent danger. It is all hands, let's get going. Um, it wasn't a hangabout, it was a direct launch, which means the Coast Guards aren't asking questions, they're saying, get your arse in gear. With the yacht reported to be taking on water, the crew launch their seven-class lifeboat and start racing towards its last reported position, just over three miles southeast of the station. So in leaving Tor Bay itself and going out past Berry Head, the, the weather conditions changed quite a lot. We had about 25 mile an hour southerly wind, so we had about one to two meter waves. Um, so there was quite a swell. First of all, taking on water, you're never quite sure what you're going to get when you get to the position. We may get there and there may not be a boat in the water and we may be looking for six people in the water. So the situation can dramatically change quite quickly. There is no hard shoulder out there. Can't just pull over, put the handbrake on and get out the car and sit behind a hedge till someone arrives. You know, if the going is getting tough, you're gonna to be swimming. 20 minutes after launching, the crew finally spot the 40-foot yacht. 
when we arrived on scene, you could tell the crew on the boat were having a bit of a rough time. You could tell they had a scare, and certainly they were glad to see us. There was a guy bailing. You could see the bow was slightly down. The rest of the waterline was showing. It's coming in the bow, that's not good. No. They weren't just taking out a teacup at a time. They were throwing out full buckets, and it wasn't taking them very long to fill it. The amount of water they were bailing out from that boat, you could tell they were physically exhausted. It's still unclear why the stricken yacht is taking on water. So Cox and James selects Richard to transfer across. You've got to pick your time. Don't rush it. When the boats come together, either jump or step. Hopefully you're there safely. Once or twice, we come alongside and it looked quite good and ready to do the transfer. But then all of a sudden, the wind would pick up. It caught their sail, and, and once it actually brought them right in front of our bow, so the coxswain had to do some manoeuvres to avoid contact. The challenge that he has to get our boat, you know, 45 tonnes worth of lifeboat next to a yacht without smashing into it is, you know, there's no mean feat, really. With Richard safely on board, a salvage pump follows close behind. Richard can now go below deck to assess the amount of water flooding in. I was quite surprised at the amount of water there was. It was just below the galley table. So it hadn't quite washed the cups off, but there was an awful lot of water for a yacht. It isn't good. It needs to be got rid of. ASAP. Need um, second pump, mate. Need the second pump. Aye, aye. Want to try and get our big one over? We knew there was a serious amount of water on board, that it needed the larger pump to actually discharge that water from being in the boat to outside of the boat where it really belongs. Right. OK. That's it. That's it. OK, line over. We then pumped for probably an hour, which it does pump an awful lot of water, that big pump. Obviously, the guys on the yacht were extremely concerned as the water level was going down. They were getting a lot more chatty and a lot more relaxed as the buckets didn't need to be used and the water level was down to the floorboards. With the water levels now finally starting to drop, the crew of the lifeboat get a closer look at the source of the problem. It was what looked like a tongue that was hanging out of a window. No, smugging a leak. Then it became quite apparent that the window had popped out. It's not been left open, it was one that should be glued, so it had come out. Brilliant. They had obviously realised what had happened, so they got one of the cushions from inside and they fed it through the window to try and stop the flow of water. With the stop gap in place, the yacht and her crew are towed back towards Brixham, in a very different state from when they set off earlier that day. Yes, mate, water ingress site was the window. The window got blocked up. There must have been thousands of buckets that we bailed out of that boat. It was litres and litres and litres going over the side every second. That morning, Darren and his five crewmates had set sail from Brixham to race across to Dartmouth, as they had done many times before. First that I realised anything was happening was just the response to the boat just felt off. All of us noticed how low the bow was in the water, um, you know, alarmingly low. Waves were almost rolling over the deck of the boat rather than crashing up the side of it and spraying. So we looked down below, and within that minute, there was already two, two foot of water inside the boat. The scary thing was how quickly it 
took on water. This wasn't just a small amount of water. This was knee height under the table, above the floorboards, which was a couple of tonne of water by that point inside the boat. That was definitely a, we might be going down here. After sending out a mayday, Sam and Darren set about trying to locate the source of the water flooding in. We were searching down below, but as it was knee deep, you know, feeling around, uh, looking for water, possibly boiling up, because it was obviously coming in fast, but couldn't find anything in the main cabin. And the front cabin door swung open, and a wave washed in through a popped out window in the front of the hull. What a moment to have a wave wash inside your boat. How it came out, I just don't know. Yeah, it, it was a fairly big window. As seawater filled the cabin, the crew plugged the window and started bailing for their lives. Out the hatch, over the side, out the hatch, over the side. You obviously look at the worst case scenario first, but we didn't have time to stew on that. We had one thing we had to do, and that was get rid of the water. So when the lifeboat arrived, I think we all had a quiet sigh of relief, um, you know, just to see that big orange boat coming out of the gloom. You really felt that you were in safe hands. Sam and his crew were finally brought back into the safety of Brixham Marina after four hours at sea. Oh, it was, it was really it was there was a real you could sort of see, in some of them, not all of them, the relief, uh, and I think they were quite panicked. Some of us had a bit of a wobble, a bit of a moment when you realise how grave it could have been. I suppose in reflection afterwards, you think, well, what if that had been different? What if I wasn't with five crew, or what if I was with the kids, um, or further offshore? It could have been a different story. Hey, you guys. Jeremy. We have saved their yacht from sinking, and it's a great feeling. Um, I mean, I went back to work, but still thinking about the job we've done and the difference we've made. A 170 miles east of Tor Bay on the Sussex coast lies the resort town of Eastbourne. Eastbourne's a quaint seaside town. It's got a lovely beach, great rock pools. There's definitely a lot of natural beauty in Eastbourne when it comes to the cliffs just around the corner. Lovely places to walk, plenty of woodlands. You've got all the countryside, the downs. It's a really amazing place. Eastbourne lies on the edge of the South Downs National Park which covers over 600 square miles of wild countryside. We've got a good variety of wildlife, plenty of seabirds, loads of foxes in town. So, yeah, there's plenty of wildlife about. And the town's proximity to all this nature keeps Eastbourne's lifeboat crew busy all year round. We get quite a few animal-related shouts. We've had three animal jobs in a row. We're going to put an RSPCA sticker on the back of the boat. <laughs> Sometimes when the page goes off, you can get the gist of what it's going to be, but really, you never know. There's always that one unexpected thing. Early August. <coughs> After receiving a call from the Coast Guard, the Eastbourne crew prepare to launch. The helm Jim, he was there waiting, and I went over to him to ask what the shout was, and I couldn't quite believe <laughs> what he said. Initial information we had on the call was there was a deer in the water. I thought he was joking. As soon as you think deer, you think, you know, one of the reindeers. <laughs> Eastbourne's D-Class inshore lifeboat is launched within 20 minutes and heads towards the deer's reported position on a beach nearly three miles southwest of the station. The atmosphere was different. Everyone was somewhat quiet because they didn't know what to expect. Enjoy. Yeah. We were all really in the dark with it. We got some extra towels in the boat so that we could peer over the antlers and over the head. 
so that it wouldn't pop our boat. After a five minute dash along the coast, the crew approached the area where the deer was last seen on one of Eastbourne's busiest stretches of beach. Once we arrived on scene, um, we got in close to the beach. We could see the deer running across the beach. It did seem distressed. It was running round frantically. It was just trying to get away from the dog that was chasing it. It was a big German Shepherd, which was bigger than the deer itself, but it managed to break away. Oh, it's a fucking water. <laughs> when it entered the water, it was uh, at full speed. It wasn't, you know, entering great. It was literally just running full belt. <laughs> I've never seen a deer swim before. I didn't know whether they could or not. There was also the lifeguards were on scene as well in their boat. They were trying to shadow it as well. So, we're just trying to keep it on the beach. While it was moving in the water, there was no safe way of getting hold of it and then it made its way back up the beach. All the crew can do now is track the deer as it sprints frantically along the beach. Trying to keep up with it was hard. Luckily, we had an empty sea, and the D-class is quite fast. It can go 25 knots, so we were able to keep up with it. But our plan was to try and head it off. After a few minutes of following the deer along the shoreline, it eventually comes to a halt. Behind that hut. Do you want to get hold of the mobile and say it's around the lifeboat museum area? It stopped in a bush, ironically outside the RNN Light Museum. Clive and Jaden disembark and make their way up to the promenade. The deer had got to that stage where it was completely exhausted. <laughs> it's in a bush, which is really. Well, at least you'll calm down a bit. And so it took shelter in the bushes. When you've got a deer that's scared, angry, and all you're armed with is a kitchen towel, it's quite a feeling. <laughs> if it does try to run, do you try and yeah. Yeah. throw the towel over it? Throw the towel, anything, just to slow it down. Although the deer is hiding in the shrubbery, it's beginning to attract attention from members of the public. So can we ask you to go up towards the car so they're away from the bushes? Can you just stop there? Sorry, can we ask you to go either go that way or right up the top because the deer's hiding in the bushes. We don't want to spook it again. Fortunately for the lifeboat crew, the East Sussex Wildlife Rescue Team have now made it on scene. All right, Trevor. Where's it gone? In there. Yeah. This man's got a, had an eye on it, so... It was a, a real relief when he arrived. He just knew what he was doing um, and took control and... It was a good feeling. It's one of my last guys to go on the greens. Deer on beaches are always a complicated rescue. Um, there's nothing simple about them generally. So they've got very high levels of adrenaline that pump around their system, so their hearts can be beating really exceptionally fast. If they get too highly stressed, they can have a heart attack and die on you. And we knew we had to keep the time of rescue down to the absolute minimum, otherwise we could potentially cause a heart attack. One of your guys able to help me? Yeah, if you God. Hold the other end of that. Straight away, we moved two long nets into place. They're called walk towards nets, but they look like tennis court nets, basically. Once the rescue team were on site, there's no point us trying to come up with a different plan. This is their area of expertise. If they say they want to use a net, we'll use a net. The idea is so that if the deer comes out of the vegetation, bolts out of the vegetation, it will slow down the animal's escape. They start to close round it a little bit. Do you want to come this way a bit, because it's just here? And then I think that was just enough to spook it. Hey, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. All right. Right, you over it? When I first had hands on the deer, you can really feel its power. It started to wiggle around. I had somewhat of a grip, but I pretty much lost it, but it was just enough. <laughs> 
It's absolutely fine now. All right. Absolutely it's vital that the deer is quickly transferred to the waiting wildlife vehicle with the minimum of stress. So we had the deer on a stretcher. We're we going straight in or? Straight in. It's got some proper poke to those hooves. I've got the front legs. So it, it wasn't just a case of just put one hand on it. It was two hands and um, and hold it firm. If you relax the grip, I think it would have gone again. All yours. Nice one. Guys, going. Put it back in the wildlife van and um, hand it over to them. That was our job done. <laughs> it was a really good feeling. There was so much relief in handing that deer over. I remember all the crowds around us started clapping. <laughs> With the deer now safely in the van, it's finally ready to be transported back to its natural habitat on the South Downs. Of course, we were hoping the deer was all right. We wanted to know whether it was injured. We're ready, ready. I'll say three, two, one. So when we saw the video of it getting released on the downs, it was, it was a good feeling. Releases are the best part of doing wildlife rescue. They, they always are. It always gives you a little bit of a buzz. Um, and you know, you always go away afterwards thinking, I hope it's okay. I think this job really showed us that you just never know what's going to happen. We've got a crew that have been in it for years and they've never done a deer. So we really never know what's going to happen when that page goes off. In Torbay, it's been two months since Sam nearly lost his yacht after it began taking on water during a race. So this is the window that came out. I've replaced this window. I've replaced all six of the windows in the hole because I don't want to take any risks. I want to go out with my kids, my family. I want to be 100% sure it's not going to happen again. It was a freak accident. Freak accidents can happen. It was pretty scary at the time, but yeah, very happy that she's back and she'll be racing again soon. And in Cleethorpes, it's been more than three months since Oliver was rescued from the incoming tide at Pirate's Cove. Yeah, a bit surreal being back first time, but good to be back as well. Yeah, the water, it was up to where this pathway was. I could only walk along here. And even up to there, there's no way you can walk any of that bit, because that bit is just fully, you'd be stuck. So I was literally just this strip of land that I was stuck on. Thanks to the Cleethorpes crew, Oliver can finally take his seat on the bench that he'd set out for that day. I suppose it's a place for reflection and just, you know, having a bit of time to yourself. It is lovely because you can see all the clay thoughts from both sides, but it is, but at the same time, it's quiet and out the way, you know what I mean? But it's nice to be back, definitely. Something in between them two boats, you see it? Panic starts setting. Are we now going to start searching for a person in the water? No, this one. It can be quite daunting to jump into the into the swell and the waves. I felt like I might die in front of all these people and none of them know I'm here. The main emotion is just concern. It's all right, boy. We wanted to bring him some kind of comfort and bring him back to safety. 